Hi there, and welcome to Step 7, Reporting Results. This is Dr. Moyer for FCS 5470, Program Evaluation. So on the very last step, which basically encompasses reporting what you found, and although this may seem very straightforward, there are several components to consider. I'll first talk about how to report quali uh, quantitative findings and then um, analyzing and reporting qualitative findings, and then um, the evaluation report itself, and I will talk about meta-analysis just a tiny bit. Okay, so if you are collecting quantitative data, which is numerical data, meaning you have numbers, um, one of the easiest ways to display like categorical numerical data, so you collected categorical data on um, how somebody ended a relationship, for example, which is pretending, and there were four options, and so you run a frequency to determine how many people picked each option, and that's what's reported here. So you can see a, a chart was created um, each of the columns are represented in the most common way uh, or the most popular way in this sample was in person. APA is very picky and very specific and I did put handouts on D2L for you to use at when you're creating tables and figures so that you do them right. It's actually really important that you learn to do them right. Um, and you'll notice like with the chart we don't have the box that um, it, not Excel, I'm sorry, Word or PowerPoint would automatically add. We get rid of that. We also get rid of the title that is automatically added. And then we put the figure one heading below the actual chart, the title, how I ended the relationship, and then in parentheses how big the sample size was. You'll notice the N is italicized as well as figure one. Um, and also within the parentheses, there's a space before and after the equal sign. Very specific formatting. Tables are a little bit different. Now we have the heading up top. Um, table one is not italicized, but the actual title is. And I always like to think of, of it as whichever text is closest to either the table or the figure. Remembering that tables will always, the title will always go on top, so table top, and figures will go on the bottom. Um, just little <laughs> mnemonic devices that help me remember. And again, there are directions on D2L for how to do this, because some people have a hard time with it. You, um, when you initially create a table, it adds all the lines, but you need to go in and get rid, <clears throat> excuse me, of most of the lines except for these three. And that's just because that's the proper way APA wants it done. So make sure you do follow those directions. Very important. If you don't know how to get rid of lines and my directions are not clear enough, you can always Google um, how to do it because that's pretty much how I do everything. That's how I learn and that's how you can learn. Here are just some examples for reporting findings in proper APA style. Um, and these are just examples of wording. So one of the things that people tend to do a lot is they'll start a sentence with a number. If you do that, you have to spell it out. And if it's percent, since you had to spell out 54, you would also spell out percent rather than using the symbol. Um, so that's a kind of a common thing that people tend to mis um, make mistakes with. So you never begin a sentence with a number, you have to spell it out. Um, when you're talking about how to answer an evaluation questions and you want to indicate the statistics that were used, you can say frequencies were computed or the mean was calculated or correlations were um, used to determine whatever the case is, but you're indicating what statistical analysis you used um, and then you have a sentence that indicates the results. I've also put a sentence on how to report findings from t-tests. I know quite a bit of you have had statistics already, so I'm not sure what kind of statistics you're planning on conducting 
for your evaluations, but I just wanted to give you an example of how to report the findings for all of them. Um, here's a chi-square example, and then here's a correlation example. Um, probably the correlation would be the one that most people would use because they understand it the most um, easily. Remember, if you do report a correlation, that the R has to be italicized as well as the P for the p-value. There's a semicolon between the two, spaces before and after the equal signs, and then after you indicate that the results were significant, you also have to give an, a qualifying explanation. So what does that mean? Some of you I know are collecting qualitative data. Um, actually quite a few of you are since you have to have different kinds of research methods. So lots of times when you have interviews, focus groups, observations, and sometimes even archival data, or document data, you have to take notes. Uh, when you are conducting interviews or when you're conducting a focus group, you're talking to people, you, it is critical that you write down every word that they say and use. And the best way to do that, of course, is to record the interview um, or to record the focus group, whatever the case may be. If you're not able to do that, a way to help with that is to, if you can, um, and the participants don't mind if you can email them the interview questions and they can type in their responses. Um, it's kind of a tricky way of getting them to do the, the work for you, the typing up, but um, it does help you capture verbatim what they wrote. So it is critical. Don't take scanty notes and, and hope to work with that. You've got to have all of the information in every single word that people utter um, becomes part of your data. You use direct quotes to illustrate points and examples, so you don't put in every single quote that participants made, but you look at the commonalities or the themes in the responses and say you saw that most of them um, were, when they were concerned with family resources, they may have indicated that the car payment was really stressful. So that would be a common theme is the car payment and then you might find a quote that seems to represent what most of the sample was saying. So it may be, um, I have to have a car in a rural area, but it's awful expensive to maintain. So that could be the quote you select. Um, so identifying the themes, this is how you'd write that up um, after examining the data and, I'm sorry, transcribing the data. After examining and transcribing all of the data, um, themes were identified, and if you do do this, you want to have at least one other person review the themes you came up with to see if they agree. And the best way to do this is to just give them the data and ask them to come up with themes. Don't tell them what yours are, and then you two can compare notes after and if there are inconsistencies, um, try to figure out why and agree on something together that represents what you both heard or saw. That'll be important um, for validity, reliability purposes. And then you would write up what the themes are and you could give an example under each, which is what I've done here. Um, so each of the five categories and then an example uh, under each of a direct quote. So just a way to show you how to write it up. It doesn't have to be written exactly like that. You can write it as a, as a narration in paragraphs. It doesn't have to be listed out like this. What's important though is that you do examine all of the data, identify the themes, and then come up with direct quotes that exemplify each of those categories or each of those themes. If you're wanting to know how many people would fit into each category, so you've got, for example, frustration. So how many people identified frustration as, as a source? Then that would be a theme that you have already had somebody else look at to identify and agree that that is a theme. Um, frustration is a theme but then you would want to count how many times 
somebody said that either used the word directly i was frustrated or they used other words language to indicate frustration and then you would count the number of times that happened so you could say the word frustration or other words that express frustration were stated 33 times in this sample. I apologize, that's my dog sneezing in the background. Oh my goodness. Are you okay? Okay, she appears to be done. Um, right, so the coding, I mean the counting. That's how that would be handled. You don't have to do that though. Honestly, um, it is a pretty sophisticated, oh, she's not done, sophisticated kind of analysis to do that and takes a lot of time. So I understand if you just identify themes, I'll be happy. And if you use quotes to illustrate the themes, I'll be happy as well. Okay, this is just an example of how you would write that up. Um, I don't really have much more to say about that. And again, just examples on how you write findings up so that you have an idea of how this is done. Um, pictures and quotes are important. If you did do observations and whether it was people or not, if it was people, if they agree to have their picture taken, that's fine. You have to get their explicit permission. Um, otherwise, if you're, let's say, observing clothing and clothing options in a department store to see, you know, how much, how big the section is for, let's say, plus size clothing versus um, smaller sizes or regular sizes, you, you might want to think about having pictures because that's going to help exemplify what you saw in a better way than how you could put it in words. Um, and again, if you do do themes, you have to have at least two people identify them for validity. And if you're coding, meaning counting, um, you have to have at least two people for reliability. Also, um, I didn't deal with, talk about this specifically, I don't think yet. It is critical that you use word for word what your subject said, even if the grammar isn't correct. So when you're typing up what they said, do not fix the grammar um, or don't even fix the spelling if they were to email responses to you. It's important to accurately depict what your participants said and that, and that is part of it. Okay, the actual evaluation report. So when you're reporting your results, there are four things that you have to take under consideration. Your target audience, the reason or the purpose for reporting your results, timing, like when do you give certain reports, and then the format and content of the actual report. The audience, so who are the people that need to know or would benefit from knowing about the evaluation and, and its findings? clearly the stakeholders and you guys have had practice now with the midterm identifying the different levels of stakeholders and it's important to recognize that different stakeholders will want to know different information um, for example a funding agency is going to want to know was this program cost effective um, the staff are going to want to know are, is their delivery method for educating their um, participants, is that working? Um, participants will want to know, is this worth my money or my time? Does this program actually change behavior or do what it's intended to do? Um, and then even the developers may only want to know, was the program implemented according to how they indicated? So everyone has a different need when it comes to this report. That doesn't mean you create several different reports and give them to different audiences, it, but it does mean that you have to include and think about all stakeholders and what needs to go into that report. Um, so figure 13.1 in your textbook um, the lists the different information needs of various stakeholders, similar to the examples I was giving you in the previous slide. 
um, what, he, what is important for each of these people to know. And again, it's going to vary. Don't create separate <laughs> reports. Just make sure that it is inclusive. Then these, the findings need to be communicated. Um, we need to communicate about the process of the evaluation itself, so how the evaluation was conducted. Um, then reporting the evaluation findings, so what was discovered, what were the results, and then making recommendations for improvement because the whole important point of conducting an evaluation is for improvement. So that is the whole point. Um, but these generally communicating the results give these three pieces of information. And it's important that the report contains all of the information collected, but when you're communicating, whether it's through um, an email or I have some different ways people can report things, um, newsletters, brochures, memos, postcards, press releases, videos, posters, blogs, social media, infographics, um, you want to think about those three things. So how the evaluation was conducted, um, what was found, and what are the recommendations for improvement. Okay, so let's go to the next one. Timing. It's important to prepare a timeline for the audience members that you've identified. When do they need to know? So depending on the stakeholder there will be different timing needs program participants want to know after the program is over um, program planners may need to have some type of report during the course of the program and a funding agency may need a report on a regular basis um, again you're going to have a, a final report that includes everything but it may be necessary throughout the evaluation to communicate with some of the stakeholders about what's going on. So during the course of a program, let's say it's a um, drunk driving program and it was designed to reduce drunk driving in the community. And the program planners say, this is you know, how I want this program done. This is how I want the information delivered. Um, participants should also do this. And then they find out that having the participants watch a movie regarding, um, I don't know, what could happen if somebody did drive drunk, maybe that's not working or it's counterintuitive or it's causing unnecessary and negative side effects, you may decide in the middle of the program to pull that piece. Um, and that's why they often want to know during the program what's going on. But it may not be the case that anyone's going to make any changes. I'm just giving examples. In general, the more often the communication, the better. Um, what this means is if you are hired to conduct an evaluation in the community, and you may be with a master's degree, um, and this specifically listed on your resume as one of your skills, you may be asked to evaluate a nonprofit agency. I know I have been asked this several times and, and do do it um, as part of my community service. So because we have training, we know um, how to do this. We have the steps that we follow and we may decide to set a timeline of a year. So I'll have this done in a year or I'll have this done in six months, whatever the case may be. What you don't want to happen is to agree to do the evaluation and then not communicate anything until the six month time period's over. Um, so even if you don't have something official and on paper, it's still important to communicate throughout the process of the evaluation with, in particular, the primary stakeholder to let them know what's happening. Um, I collected the data, I'm in the data analysis, you know, things are looking good, or um, I have the resources I need, or you may even have questions. Do you know where I could talk to so-and-so? Um, but it is important to have communication constant. And, and in general, always, the more often, the better. The overall timing of the communication is tied to the life cycle of the program, of course, um, or the department, the organization, the nonprofit, um, 
or even just the issue that's a subject of the evaluation. So it may be the case that a program is only a week long and that's going to change how communication is conducted versus a program that is two years long. Doesn't mean you still want frequent communication, but the week long program may require that you check in with the primary stakeholder every day where the two year may be, you know, once a month is good enough. It, it just depends. And the purpose of the timeline for communication is to indicate to your stakeholders when they can expect to hear from you. It holds you as the evaluator accountable. If you tell them from the very beginning, um, here's when you can expect to receive this, 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 and you give them dates, they're going to expect to hear from you by those dates. If they don't, it looks really bad. And if you're being paid, you may not get paid. So if you tell them that after two weeks, you're going to have a preliminary um, pre-data collection meeting or communication, you're going to send them a memo, then make sure that you do. Um, and again, like I said, it holds us accountable and it is important for the primary, for the stakeholders to know what's going on. Nothing is worse than, oh, we hired a, an evaluator, but I haven't heard from him or her and I have no idea what's going on. That doesn't look good at all. I added this because I, I find this is true of students a lot, um, as well as even my colleagues. Communications and reports often take more time than evaluators anticipate. My general rule is that whatever amount of time I think something is going to take, let's say grading, if I think it's going to take six hours to grade exams, it's probably actually going to take me 12. So I pretty much double everything. And if I finish early, great. But it, it's I'm more successful when I set myself up for realistic expectations. If I think that it's going to take me two weeks to conduct an evaluation of a program, then I will tell them four weeks. Because I know things come up that you didn't plan on and things always take longer than you, you expect, especially if you're relying on other people. So it's not just you, you're not just counting on you, you don't have 100% control of how everything goes and that can be incredibly frustrating, but that's the nature of the beast and it is the nature of life. So um, just keep that in the back of your mind and it, ac it actually applies to everything in my life. So if I think that hey, I'm going to um, paint the back bedroom. I should be able to get that done in four hours. Then I also think I yeah, probably should double that. It's probably really going to be eight hours. And it usually is right. Um, it also works with a cost thing too. Maybe not so much with an evaluation, although it does work with that, but just how much things cost. So if you think, oh, it's only going to be $300 to fix the car, um, plan on 600 so you're not hugely surprised when you go to pick it up. Okay, getting a little off track. Format, format and content. What format is the best? Um, it really is just going to depend. It depends on the audience. Um, it depends on when, the, you know, the timing of the communication. Um, at the end of an evaluation, of course, a formal report should always be prepared and it should be thorough and complete. Um, it shouldn't leave anything out, but you may have several mini communications that go on um, throughout the process of the evaluation so you can keep people up to date and communicate with them on a regular basis. So all evaluations will require a formal report at the end, but there may be other forms of mini communication throughout the evaluation. Okay, some general rules about the evaluation report. This applies to your own project for this class. Write and speak in a clear, jargon-free style. Don't throw big words in to be impressive. Um, speak very clearly. In general, speak slower than feels comfortable. That's because most of us will rush or speak really fast, especially if we're nervous, um, and that actually comes across as in a negative manner. 
You don't want to be talking really fast and going right through everything and then having nobody really understand even what you're saying. So just tell yourself in your mind ahead of time, speak slower. Use tables of graphs and charts and illustrations, but don't overuse them. Um, use them only when you think you need to use them to exemplify the data. Don't throw tables and graphs in because you think it's cool um, or fun because they can be intimidating. And if you do too many, people's eyes kind of glaze and they, they don't even look at them. We already talked about the difference between communicating qualitative and quantitative findings. Um, just again, reminding you about the qualitative, you may be using pictures or, or direct quotes. Um, where quantitative would be more numbers. Communicating negative findings. Um, you may find yourself in the position of having to do this. This has actually happened to me a great deal, um, not only with evaluating programs, but also with evaluating student work um, on exams or projects. So sometimes you have to communicate negative feedback. And Lots of evaluators will leave it out because they don't want to make the stakeholder angry. But you, I mean, the whole point of an evaluation is improvement. So you have to communicate that. You have to be upfront and let them know. But what I find works best and what most experts will recommend is that you use the sandwich method. So you place negative feedback in between the slices of positive feedback bread. The negative feedback is like the meat. So you start out with something, you know, this program has been very effective at blah, 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 and it's well received in the community. Unfortunately, the data that I collected shows it's not really changing um, adolescent behavior. So we need to think about how to improve that. Um, however, the adolescents enjoy the program and that's very positive. We can work with different methodologies for trying to change their behavior. And that's when you move right into recommendations. For example, um, it's, it appears that just reading a book on whatever it is they're supposed to be changing is not effective. Perhaps we could incorporate or you, a lot of people will say we because it does feel softer. Um, so you might say, well, we could inc incorporate videos or scavenger hunts online or whatever the case may be, whatever recommendations that you have. So you go right into that. That's how you deal with negative feedback. You put it in between some positive feedback, the beginning, positive feedback right after, and then you make recommendations for change. You don't just leave it hanging out there like, too bad, dude, your program sucks and doesn't work. Um, you say, you know, this may not be effective, however, I have done some research and looked into other effective delivery methods and it appears that A, B, C, and D might be more effective. So you have to do it. Just give some thought to it, um, particularly if you're having to give it in person. Be careful of your facial expressions. I would suggest practicing in front of a camera or a mirror if you're going to have a meeting with stakeholders and report findings so that you can see what your face looks like when you do that, or even practice with a friend so they can let you know. You want to keep your face as um, uh, you know, unbiased, unexpressive as possible, but you don't want to be like a robot. I mean, you just, you know, you don't want to be inappropriate. You don't want to smile when given any negative findings, um, but you don't want to look like you're going to have a heart attack either. Um, it, you just have to find that right facial expression, that right tone, what feels comfortable and what other people get, report back to you is most effective for you. Appearance matters. I can't stress that enough. That's why a lot of the professors um, in our on-campus program will require students to dress up when they have to give a presentation because Appearance makes a difference. People feel better when they look better. And it looks like you have something important to say when you show up in a suit versus um, pajama bottoms and a tank top and slippers. <laughs> this makes a difference. When at all, if this is at all possible, it's best to give a personal presentation. So it's best to be there 
face to face in front of your primary stakeholders. Why is this the case? People respond more favorably to other people giving them feedback directly face to face. They take it better. Um, learning occurs more easily through an interpersonal dialogue. Rather than just relying on giving a report and having people read it, um, you make sure that all the information is, is stated um, and that they hear you and they can ask questions about it. People will always pay more attention to a person than they will to a written report. You know this is probably true of you, um, so I'm sure you understand that. The presentation can be adjusted to meet the needs of the audience. So let's say you had planned on a 60-minute presentation and you're going through and you're trying to be professional and talk slowly and you realize people are squirming and look at their watches and it's just not going well and you're sensing they really just want to get out of there, you can adjust. Um, you could say, well, we're going to skip sections two and three and get right to the findings um, because that's the most important part and, and people will probably perk up like, oh, thank God, um, depending on what's going on. But you can read your audience is what I'm saying. And, and I, I do this, try to do this in class. Watch what people are doing, their facial expressions, um, their body language. Do they look tired? Do they look irritated? Do they look angry? Um, sometimes people look angry and that requires a big adjustment. <laughs> uh, specific questions can also be asked. That can't be stated enough. People might ask questions if you just turn in a written report, but they, they're they less likely to do so than if you present it face to face. Um, and then face, your own facial feedback. You can determine um, not only your own, but the audience's as well. So you can as I said, see on their faces, whether they're getting it or not. Um, and you can convey emotion in your presentation using your facial expressions. And that can sometimes make the findings either more acceptable um, or more understandable. Finally, one of the most important things, if you have negative news, you're going to have to deliver. It's much better to do it in person. You can soften the effect of that in person. And you have more control over how somebody is responding to that. The sections of a formal written evaluation report, um, this is also in your assignment, but you typically there's an executive summary, um, no more than one to two pages long, single spaced. And that just gets at the heart of everything that went on. You just give a quick overview uh, so somebody can just look at that and go, okay, I see what happened. Um, then you have a proper introduction. You have the program and evaluation description. And this is where you're going to provide a lot of detail. You can't provide too much detail. You, you have to give the details so that people understand what happened. Um, the design and the methods that were used, the findings, the conclusions and the recommendations, and you may want to bring in existing literature or other expert opinion in this section to support what you're recommending. If there is some kind of page limit on a formal report, let's say you are hired to um, evaluate a soup kitchen, and they say, we want to report when you're done, but no more than 10 pages. You can add appendices, and those can be emailed if they don't want the paper, have the appendices printed out on paper. Um, but that's where you can add pretty much anything in an appendix. See Appendix A, see Appendix B, and that's where you add additional material, and the reader can choose whether or not to go to the appendices. But it allows you to be very um, detailed and specific without going over the limit. Other formats, I, I jumped to this earlier, um, and it just depends. Some people may want you to write up a blurb in a newsletter for an organization regarding what was found. Um, they may want you to create a brochure. They may want a memo that gets distributed or a postcard. Um, they may want a press release that's given to local newspapers or even television news programs. Um, you may have to create a video that's going to be used either circulated on the web or 
placed on someone's website, um, posters are sometimes used to communicate findings, blogs, um, social media. Sometimes you know you have to put it out there on Twitter. And you're really limited what you can say. Um, and then infographics are, are pretty popular right now, where they use pictures and and break it down for lay take research and break it down for a lay person so they understand it. So some obstacles for effective utilization, and this means of your recommendations, you know, why people might not actually do what you suggest. Um, the first one could be that they're, the manager doesn't have the power or the resources or both to do it. So you may recommend that they change their delivery method from giving adolescents books to read to actually using videos but the manager may say to you, we don't have the money for that. Um, and that becomes kind of a quandary in and of itself. Usually when that happens, you don't want to just outright dismiss what the recommendation was. You want to brainstorm with the manager and say, well, let's see how, let's let me, you know, or even if you need time, you can come back to them. Let me think about that, um, how I could help you get your hands on some videos, or could we create them? Maybe we can talk to the local college or university and see if it could be a class project. Um, so don't you know just leave them hanging and, sh and let them shut you down. Value conflicts among stakeholders. So you know what is the most important thing? Stakeholders will argue about this. Of course, funding agencies are always going to say it's money. Um, participants are always going to say it's whether it works. You know, there may be value conflicts that inhibit the ability to actually incorporate the recommendations that were made by the evaluator. Um, and that, again, can be, you know, you can have a meeting with stakeholders and, and try to find that gray area where people meet um, to help them identify that. You know, we do have some like, we do agree on some areas that need to be focused on immediately. Here's where we agree. Um, or it could be methodological issues. You may have bitten off more than you can chew. You didn't conduct the evaluation correctly because you didn't have the, the proper skills or training. Let's say that you're trying to establish causality with the findings or the, the evaluation you conduct, but all you did was run correlations and you're trying to make the argument that A is causing B, but you don't ha you didn't run the correct statistics or collect the data to establish that. So when you go to make recommendations, you may not have people having faith in what you're recommending because of the methodological issues. Um, and then finally, evaluating a program at arm's length. If you don't include the staff, um, I'm sorry, the program staff, the directors and even participants voice in an evaluation then many stakeholders will feel like well they really just kind of skirted around the program they didn't get at the heart of it um, they don't really know what's going on here and this can be common with staff like they never ask me anything they just ask the customers and they ask the you know managers but I'm the one that could tell them that our busiest time is 7.30 in the morning or whatever the case may be. So it's why we recommend triangulation and why we recommend having not only different methods but different sources of data so that you can say, actually, I did talk to the staff. I have that piece um, so that you're getting a more accurate picture. Finally, I would just ask you to think about yourself. Um, when somebody is delivering information to you or making recommendations for change, constructive criticism, you know, how do you like to hear it? What makes you actually consider it? What makes you feel comfortable when that's happening? What makes you feel uncomfortable? Um, how Have you ever had to have some really difficult feedback delivered to you, but the person did it in such a way that you actually left thanking them and you actually felt okay about it and you were like, they were so nice, even though they just told you that, you know, your work sucks. Um, there is a, uh, there's some people have a real gift to that, but think about what appeals to you. 
Um, do you prefer somebody to call you in and not even look you in the eye, give you the negative feedback, and then tell you to leave? Probably not. Um, you probably want to have some establish some type of rapport first, feel comfortable, make eye contact, etc. Just think about what you're going to respond to because that's going to help you be a better communicator when it comes time to communicate the findings. And that is all I have for this PowerPoint.